Hello, and welcome to the third and final session of Prime Finance's Asia Conference. My name is Bob Pickle. I'm chair of Prime Finance, and I'm happy to welcome you here to our third session entitled Disrupted Dispute Resolution, The New Frontier. Over the course of the next hour and a half, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Anselmo Reyes, uh, as well as a panel uh, headed by Julita Panjaitin. Uh, and they will discuss the challenges and opportunities of resolving disputes in a virtual context, something that many of you are probably dealing with uh, these days in light of the pandemic. Among the topics they'll discuss will be how to build and trust and create focus in mediation and settlement discussions, adapting to the virtual hearing environment, and considering whether dispute resolution can remain an effective international endeavor as video connects across the distance, but distance and time zones still divide the parties. Before we turn to some opening remarks from myself and then the keynote address, I wanted to just mention a few housekeeping items. First of all, you should know that this session is being recorded and will be distributed later. Attendees who continue to participate will be taken to have consented to such recording. Attendees are muted and have their video turned off. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A function to get in touch. It should be somewhere on your screen there, perhaps at the bottom or the top. It can be helpful to include your name and affiliation when you submit a question. Questions for the panel will be answered at the end of the session. We'll use the chat box to send messages to all attendees during the course of the session. Please note that the chat function is not enabled for attendees to send messages. Uh, so again, please use the Q&A function to send questions to the panelists or if you have questions of a technical nature. I'd like to thank Clifford Chance our global law firm sponsor for this event, DTCC, LCH, and Rudder Associates, who are sponsoring the Prime Finance Asia Conference, and also Burford Capital, uh, who is sponsoring this particular session. I'd also like to thank LexisNexis and Amlex for their support of this conference together with their promotion. And one other thing that you should be aware, the views and comments expressed by the speakers or moderator during this panel are their own and are not made on behalf of any organization with which they are affiliated. Any views or comments of any of the participants in the session are not to be referred to on an attributed basis without the permission of the relevant individual. And if for some chance you have a question or a topic you want to be quoted, quoting somebody on, please contact Camilla McPherson and she can coordinate with the individual panelists. Before I turn it over to Jolita Panjaitin to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, I just wanted to say a few things about Prime Finance. You've heard from Camilla McPherson, you saw uh, Jeff Golden. Camilla is our head of secretariat. Jeff is our founder and chair emeritus, and I'm the chair, current chair of the management board of Prime Finance. I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of Prime Finance. Uh, as we hope for the end of the pandemic, I'd like to remind everyone of what we aim to achieve now almost a decade into uh, the organization of prime finance. We want to expand the ways in which financial disputes are resolved. That's a focus on arbitration, highlighting the benefits of the arbitration process, uh, among, the, among those benefits being flexibility, confidentiality, and enforceability. We also have a focus on mediation, and you'll hear some of that from the panelists later in the session. We want to encourage intervention to get to a satisfactory result quickly. And we can achieve this in part through our co cooperation agreement with the Permanent Court of Arbitration and The Hague. They provide administrative support for us and the, pro the PCA's proven strengths in administering disputes uh, is one of the uh, great assets that we have as an organization. We also want to support the judiciary uh, not to exclude them, while we develop arbitration and mediation, we also uh, believe that there's obviously a continuing important role for the judiciary. We wanna support the judiciary in their understanding of complex financial instruments. Our outreach to them is a minimum, lets them know that we have this unique resource, our prime experts available to them. We also reach out uh, to do judicial education where desired. We can organize, organize sessions to help build judicial capacity to resolve financial disputes. And it allows us to merge the expertise that we have among our experts uh, with the expertise of judges around the world. 
We are also developing tools to aid the understanding of finance and how effective dispute resolution supports the global economy. We have our conferences, which unfortunately we've had to put on hold during the, during the pandemic, but we hope to meet again in person around the globe in two, 2021 and beyond in The Hague, in Asia, in New York, and we hope elsewhere as well. We will continue our prime time sessions. This, is a, this uh, Asia event is our virtual session here, but we've had two series of our prime time sessions and we are already in the midst of planning a third series in the first quarter of next year. We'll continue to utilize that platform uh, even after in-person conference, uh, in conferences resume so that we can reach other areas of the world and we can address a wider range of topics. We also have a unique partnership with LexisNexis, not just in their support of these events, but also a resource that we provide to our experts and to the judges with whom we meet that gives them access to financial information uh, and reports on financial uh, legal developments around the world. Uh, and in the past year, we've provided more content from our prime experts uh, to LexisNexis than we've had in any year previously. Obviously, a big part of this is building on our people and relying on our people uh, we have our experts, that's the core of what we do, and it's one of our greatest assets. Uh, all the areas above are made stronger, all, all the areas I've mentioned are made stronger and are more effective through the involvement of our experts. We have our management board and our advisory boards who are actively considering new initiatives and the support of the organization. We are developing committees of our experts, for instance, judges, uh, and also subject matter areas such as FinTech and su sustainability. And we also have in Camilla McPherson, our head of secretariat, uh, a very strong individual, uh, someone in, who in the course of just a little over a year with Prime has made a real difference in this most challenging of times. We look forward to supporting her and to seeing her grow in her role as head of secretariat. Uh, finally, uh, we continue to focus on the financial support for the organization the pandemic has heightened an already significant challenge that we faced in providing financial support uh, that we need to pursue these ambitious goals. We seek support from all who have an interest in supporting our mission. I'll have a little bit more to say about that at the very end of the session. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the moderator of our session, Jalita Panjaitan, to introduce our keynote speaker. Jalita is a partner and head of dispute resolution uh, for Asia at Linklaters in Singapore. She's a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, she is a prime finance expert, and she has been extremely helpful uh, as part of our conference steering committee in putting these uh, Asia sessions together, including organize the session that you're joining us for today. Julia? Thank you so much, Bob. And, uh... Good morning, good evening to those of you uh, joining us live uh, and whatever time of day, greetings to you if you are watching us uh, in a recorded setting. Let me add my warm welcome to this third and final session of the Prime Finance Asia Conference for the first time uh, based in Asia, uh, although we can't say physically held here, but more of that later on. In the previous two sessions uh, of our conference on Tuesday and last Friday, we heard frequent mention of the prospect of future disputes arising from such issues as sustainable finance, geopolitical tension, technological competition, COVID defaults, LIBOR transition, data privacy breaches, uh, the use or misuse of blockchain and cryptocurrency, and operational liability of artificial intelligence. I think there can be little doubt that there is fertile ground for disputes to arise from the various disruptions to our economies and to finance itself in, in recent times. But the process of international financial dispute resolution is itself also in a state of disruption, uh, most immediately uh, caused by the inability to conduct litigation arbitration and mediation by way of in-person hearings or negotiation. And that interruption has forced the dispute resolution industry and institutions uh, to engage with the developing technology that is available to support uh, the conduct of human interaction uh, in ways that seek to approximate uh, the in-person experience. But can it be good enough to do justice or resolve disputes on screen? by virtual instead of physical attendance? 
Or could it be even better? Uh, to take a first pass at some of these issues, and no doubt to kick off a lively discussion among our fantastic panel, uh, it is my great privilege to introduce Justice Anselma Reyes, an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court, and formerly also a judge of the Hong Kong High Court, as well as being a highly regarded academic and independent arbitrator. And Justice Reyes is also a prime finance expert. So Judge, I invite you to begin by sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has accelerated resort to remote technology for the conduct of international commercial dispute resolution, whether litigation, arbitration, or mediation. What are the implications of this acceleration? I propose to catalog a few, some big, some small, in no particular order. Let me start by declaring where I stand on remote technology. Some may regard the current use of remote technology as a passing phase. Their thinking would be that as more of the public is vaccinated against COVID-19 and herd immunity grows, international dispute resolution can go back to the way things used to be. I believe that would be retrograde. I suggest that like Orpheus, we must not look back. We should focus instead on understanding the possibilities that the new normal offers and realizing them. What has remote technology meant? On a basic level, it has lowered the carbon footprint of international dispute resolution. There is now no need for parties, lawyers, arbitrators, witnesses, and support staff to travel from one country to another, take instructions, meet in conference, or hold a substantive hearing. Just about everything can be done from the comfort of one's own home, including the transmission and receipt of voluminous documents. There are grumbles about accommodating time zone differences, but at the end of the day, occasionally staying up beyond midnight to hear a witness in a hearing taking place over different time zones is a small price to pay for no longer having to contend with incessant travel, jet lag, strange hotels, and solitary dinners. We all have griped at some time or other about the high cost of international dispute resolution. We have wondered if there was a way to bring down its costs. The genie of remote technology has granted at least part of our wish. It has reduced a significant contributor to the cost of dispute resolution, and in doing so, has made cross-border dispute resolution more accessible to everyone. Remote technology has exposed the delocalized nature of international dispute resolution. For instance, the seat of arbitration remains relevant in setting a standard of due process that an arbitration must adhere to if an award is not to be set aside. But that apart, does the concept of seat have much significance post COVID-19? Where an arbitration can take place entirely by Zoom or WebEx with parties, lawyers, counsel, witnesses, interpreters and staff scattered around the world, will the law of a seat regarding who can represent a party or whether or not third party funding is allowed have much relevance? Geography no longer matters. That a locality is physically remote, for example, Australia, should no longer be an impediment to the locality promoting itself as an international dispute resolution hub. Instead, what will be crucial is the reputation of that jurisdiction's judiciary. To what extent are its judges familiar with transnational commercial principles? And to what extent will its judiciary apply international norms efficiently and cost effectively in a just, impartial, and independent manner? COVID-19 forces us to confront what is important in international dispute resolution and what can be dispensed with. I'm referring here, among other matters, to infrastructure. For example, an elegant physical venue dedicated to the hearing of arbitrations might be nice to have, but is it essential? Where a country has limited financial resources, it may be better to invest those resources in ensuring that its population and businesses have ready access to laptops, stable bandwidth, and network services 
at an affordable price. I'm also referring to procedural considerations. For example, there is a debate about whether a party is entitled to face-to-face -face hearing. A party, it is said, should be able to confront the other side's witnesses eye to eye to test the truth of their evidence. But this proposition has always struck me as being of doubtful validity. Judges and arbitrators have repeatedly warned that demeanor is a treacherous guide to whether someone is telling the truth. The trickster speaks with practiced glibness while looking you straight in the eye. The honest witness rambles incoherently and is too nervous to look at his or her interlocutor. Judges, arbitrators, and mediators have no built-in lie detectors. The only tool that they have to discern the truth is the balance of probability. What in light of the totality of evidence was more likely than not to have transpired. The balance of probability functions just as well in a remote as a physical hearing. Of course, there may be situations where a physical hearing is the only sensible option. A party, its counsel, or a key witness may be based in a place with no ready access to reliable bandwidth, whether at home or in the nearby office. So that it will not be possible to examine a witness in a reasonably uninterrupted fashion. In that case, a remote hearing may not provide a party with a reasonable opportunity to present its case and so may not be consonant with due process. Such situations can be dealt with case by case in light of their peculiar circumstances. The only point that I would make is that COVID-19 has demonstrated that physical hearings are not essential to international commercial arbitration or litigation. Another procedural concern has been over the coaching of witnesses. In a remote hearing, can we be sure that the other side's witnesses are not being coached by a hidden person? To deal with this, courts and tribunals have developed protocols whereby a witness may be asked to pan a camera around a room to show who else is there. However, is the coaching of witnesses while giving evidence, as opposed to when they are being prepared at some point beforehand by counsel, is that a real concern? Judges and arbitrators regularly deplore how much of protracted cross-examination before them has been a waste of time. Even experienced lawyers seem to have little idea of how to conduct effective cross-examination. Rather than worrying about the coaching of witnesses, our time would, I suggest, be better spent honing our skills in the conduct of brisk and pinpoint cross-examination. With a skilled cross-examiner, there should be no need to pan a camera around the room. It will be painfully evident within a short period if a witness is being coached in the course of his or her examination or has been coached in the course of his or her preparation. A third procedural concern has been that remote technology will make the hot tubbing of experts difficult. On this, I can only speak from personal experience. We recently heard a case in the Singapore International Commercial Court, the SICC, where five sets of experts were heard in successive hot tubs. That was the only way that all the experts could be heard within the allotted time. The experts first made PowerPoint presentations via Zoom's share screen function. The experts were then cross-examined by counsel. Finally, the court conducted a discussion among them. As far as I could see, the exercise went smoothly. Because of time zone differences, the hearings had to take place from early evening to nearly midnight Singapore time. One expert connected from a remote island in the east coast of the US. Internet on the island was unstable, and in the end, the expert had to take part via telephone. But evidence taking was not impaired in any serious way. I suggest that the real problem with hot tubbing, whether conducted remotely or face to face, is that many tribunals do not know how to manage witness conferencing. Tribunals are often insufficiently prepared and have not put in time. Uh, to work out precisely how to conduct a hot tub efficiently. In short, instead of lamenting that remote technology has made this or that procedural aspect problematic, we should be acknowledging our foibles as service providers and focus on enhancing our skills at managing the situations that have always been a part of international dispute resolution. Have we lost anything by the greater use of remote technology? Have we, for instance, lost the human touch? 
an ability to engage on an intimate level face to face? Does any such loss mean that we are less likely to achieve resolutions that cater to the real needs of the parties? The loss may encompass apparently trivial, but perhaps psychologically significant details. For example, the pressure to settle that parties feel at the threshold of a physical court or outside the door of the actual room where an arbitration is to take place. It may entail more substantial considerations. For example, does a remote technology hamper our ability correctly to read each other's nonverbal signals in mediation? In the absence of empirical studies, it is difficult to answer these questions now. Nonetheless, we should not expect remote hearings precisely to mirror face-to-face -face hearings. They are not the same experience. We gain some things and lose others by the use of remote technology. The systematic use of remote technology is new to all of us. We are still learning what can and what cannot be achieved. My expectation is that at the end of the day, what we gain will be significantly more than what we may lose. And if deemed sufficiently important, what we lose can be compensated by other expedients. Thus, as far as mediation is concerned, much as we have developed a knack for understanding the subtle motivations of characters in a film, in due course, we will be more adept at discerning each other's inner thoughts over remote technology. As for last minute settlements, we can develop a practice whereby the day before a substantial court or arbitration hearing, the parties routinely contact each other to explore settlement. Finally, for now, there is the question of which mode of international dispute resolution wins and which loses due to COVID-19 and the accelerated use of remote technology. At first blush, as a mode of dispute resolution, mediation should come into its own in the COVID-19 era, subject to parties overcoming the perception, right or wrong, that virtual technology lacks intimacy and spontaneity it would make sense to attempt mediation in all commercial disputes. On the other hand, the financial recession and cash flow difficulties that have become a corollary of COVID-19 suggest that given the high costs and lengthy timescales, unfortunately now associated with it, unless something changes dramatically, international commercial arbitration will become increasingly unsustainable as a mode of dispute resolution. There is nonetheless one aspect of dispute resolution where, surprisingly, arbitration apparently has an edge over litigation. A problem arises where, where a court in country A wishes to take evidence from a witness in country B. In many jurisdictions, it is an affront to national sovereignty to take evidence, even by, even by remote technology, from witnesses within such jurisdictions for use before a foreign court. Permission for taking evidence remotely has to be obtained. But the procedure in many countries for obtaining the requisite clearance is obscure. Does one apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Justice, or the court for permission? Is permission routinely given? Or if not, what criteria are used to determine whether permission will be granted? Accession to the 1970 Hague Convention on taking evidence abroad would be a first step to tackling the problem. However, the convention's procedures for obtaining evidence abroad are lengthy and cumbersome and need to be updated for the COVID-19 era. By contrast, the difficulty does not arise in international commercial arbitration. If witnesses are willing to give evidence voluntarily in an arbitration seated elsewhere, countries do not seem overly concerned, perhaps because arbitration is a matter of private arrangement rather than an exercise of sovereign authority. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the highlighted problem has had the consequence of parties finding it easier at present to resolve their cross-border commercial disputes through arbitration rather than litigation. I thank Prime Finance for the opportunity to share some thoughts on disruption and disputes in a changing world this morning, Singapore time. I look forward to hearing the views of the panelists in the discussion that follows this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge, uh, for your fascinating and wide-ranging reflections this morning, raising, I think, at least as many questions as you offered answers. Uh, and we will come back to hear from you a little later on in, in some of the discussion towards the end. Uh, but to pick up the discussion now, we are fortunate to have an extremely eminent panel 
uh, with us today. Uh, so I'll just give them each a brief introduction to you. Judith Gill, QC, is an arbitrator at 20 Essex Court, a vice president of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration and honorary vice president of the LCIA Court. The Honourable Jim Spiegelman, ACQC, is an arbitrator at one Essex Court, a former Chief Justice of New South Wales and also a former non-permanent judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. And Judith and Jim are both also prime finance experts. And finally, Melody Wang, who is a partner with Fungda Partners in Beijing. <clears throat> Her practice is focused on complex, high stakes disputes, investigations and PRC regulatory compliance, often in a cross-border context. So let's begin our conversation. I wanted to start with some discussion around observations on the efficiency and effectiveness of conducting dispute resolution online. And Justice Ray has touched on a number of, of features that have been either criticized or, or lauded in the course of conducting these sorts of hearings and proceedings. Judith, perhaps if we start with you, I'm interested in um, some of the thoughts around technical support or infrastructure and how that may play into the equality or inequality of parties' ability to impress their case upon the tribunal, and perhaps the extent to which they're seeking accommodations to ensure that they, they receive that um, fair opportunity. What are you seeing in, in the hearings that you've been conducting? I mean, I think it's, it's important on this topic to, to distinguish between inequalities and differing levels of familiarization and experience with the technologies that we're using. Um, I think Anselmo said, you know, this is new for all of us. That is very true. Um, but it increasingly, and we're now, what, nine months into this new world, um, people become more familiar with the technology. But for some, nevertheless, you know, there's, there's, there's always going to be a first time of having to conduct a hearing through a virtual platform. Um, but to my mind, that's, that's no more an inequality than it would be in an in-person hearing where perhaps you have a very experienced uh, advocate or team on one side and a less experienced team on the other side. So I think that's an important uh, distinction to make. Um, in terms of inequalities, um, I think in the, in the modern world, businesses and law firms wherever they are, have internet access. Um, it's, you know, there are, I've certainly not encountered an issue where a party genuinely simply has no access to uh, internet or internet that is capable of sustaining uh, a virtual hearing. Um, but obviously it does, uh, you know, there can be issues from time to time. We've all done hearings where, you know, suddenly someone has frozen and then you've got that awkward silence of, well, uh, was, was, was that a deliberate pause or have you just frozen? Is it my Wi-Fi? Is it your Wi-Fi? Um, but I think in the hearings that I've done, interruptions, certainly serious interruptions, are really quite rare. And um, quite often it's the arbitrators <laughs> rather than counsel and, and, and the law firms who've, who've got some really good setups. Uh, and I suppose my perspective ultimately is that, you know, the, the, we are all learning. I didn't have a little speaker before March. Now I do. And I would not dream of doing a hearing without that external speaker plugged in. But we're talking, what, $100 sing dollars for a little speaker? It's, you know, this, I, I, my, my own perspective is, you know, there are changes we will find we need to make but none of it is prohibitively difficult to do or, or uh, expensive. Uh, and, you know, I think one other feature of virtual hearings that I see is in some ways, it's, it's actually a great leveler. You know, if you are in a, an in-person hearing, there is a certain hierarchy within the room. You have your arbitrators at one end, you'll have your, um, advocacy team in, in in order sitting down the rows well on a virtual hearing we're just all little boxes we're all the same size little boxes unless we're actually speaking so you know, again I think in some ways the virtual hearing is a leveler um, 
but it's different. And I think people just have to um, accept that it's different and that we are all, as Anselmo says, we're all still learning uh, and we all have to make some uh, adjustments. You know, as, as an arbitrator, if you're in an in-person hearing, I've had arbitrators say, you know, I didn't travel thousands of miles just to look at a screen. Well, now that's exactly what we do. And it's not one screen, it's maybe three screens. Um, and that is a new skill, a new balance that, that we have to learn. For the council teams, communication requires perhaps a bit more uh, effort in terms of it's not just the post-it post notes coming up the line. There needs to be attention and, and a system in place for communicating uh, messages back and forth. Um, you know, the interaction perhaps is less, uh, obviously, and you're in a, a, a hearing, you've got a transcript. Over speaking is always a problem, but it's perhaps more extreme in the, the virtual context. So you need to have a bit more uh, discipline with all of that. You cannot, as counsel, you cannot watch the arbitrator's pen to see when they finish taking their notes, because chances are they're actually looking at their screens and they're highlighting or they're writing notes actually in an electronic form. So there are differences, but from my experience, from my perspective, I don't see any of this as inequalities, if you will, or, or technological impediments that need to make us anxious about how we now operate in this, uh, in this uh, new way. They're simply challenges which can and regularly are being overcome. Thanks very much, Judith. And maybe we could turn Melody to you from the sort of council perspective. I don't know whether you're missing seeing a tribunal member's pen across the page. Uh, what sort of um, what sort of differences are you experiencing uh, conducting hearings in this way? And, and again, thinking of of ways in which you want to ensure that your presentation is is at least as as equally received by the tribunal or, or by the court as as your opponents. Uh, what sort of things are you are you focusing on in that context? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jalida. Um, that's an interesting question, I think. And um, um, given that the, the sort of the involvement of technology and now we're facing this pandemic, um, I think the, the virtual hearing certainly is, um, is a great tool um, to speed up um, the process, the proceeding and speed up the hearings. And uh, the benefit, the upside of, of, of the virtual hearings obviously is um, that traditionally the sort of the time and costs incurred from frequently long haul travels uh, may be a hindrance to some clients uh, or their in-house team, for example, to be able to access to physical hearings. Uh, but the virtual hearings would allow more people to be able to at least observe the hearing. Um, like one of the cases I've had earlier this year um, that originally there wasn't really going to be a huge uh, in-house team going to flow into um, uh, Hong Kong um, to, 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 to sort of observe and participate the hearing. But with, with it's gone virtual, actually, um, the, the whole team actually dial in um, and would be able to observe it. So in that sense, I think it increases um, the efficiency and, and a certain level of fairness because it allows um, people and the whole team to be able to participate um, mm -hmm. for both sides. So that's, that's certainly the, uh, the benefit. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's certainly true that the large companies and large law firms tend to be more willing to invest in technology and, and support and sort of infrastructure um, on that level, and which may put um, some smaller firms, for example, at sort of certainly a, a disadvantage um, in that regard in terms of the, the sort of the, the flow of the, the, the hearing, then it may be smoother uh, if you have better technology and, and support. Um, I, I would say that I, I observed the one thing that's very interesting, um, especially in the context of Chinese uh, litigation proceedings that um, is in particular earlier this year, uh, because of the lockdown, we, we did have uh, a lot of those virtual hearings online with judges. Um, and sometimes you would feel like the judges would turn off the video just for better connections because they, 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 they don't really uh, think they have a very good um, uh, Wi-Fi connections, uh, for example, and then they would just turn off the video. And certainly that's that's that becomes um, more difficult for counsel to get I mean, clear instructions from judges and also a lot of times to read 
um, the judge, just like uh, what Judith was, was suggesting, like basically you can see that when arbitrators were taking notes or when stopped taking notes. Um, so, 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 so in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's sort of challenging because um, previously in the in-person hearing, um, it wouldn't be uncommon, I think, for um, the council to have their, your, your presentation being interrupted by an arbitrator or a judge uh, because they have some questions what, to what you just said. Um, that can be very, <clears throat> excuse me, that can be very helpful because then you can sense, well, whether the argument you're making is convincing or whether you think the issue you're discussing is, I mean, sort of is a critical issue in their mind, um, that, that, that those would be very valuable information and then you need to adapt and be spontaneous. Um, but in virtual hearings, I think there tends to be less this sort of inter interruptions uh, from either the arbitrators or uh, the judges because they don't want to interrupt the flow of the hearing, I think. So um, that part, I, I mean, from my perspective, is certainly is missed. And um, that was a very useful, <clears throat> th th those kind of useful cue or useful hint uh, from the adjudicators that um, I think counsel would oftentimes take it very seriously and into consideration. Um, so, in, so in terms of the fairness, I guess the challenges would uh, be um, sort of uh, present for both parties. Um, I, I don't really see that too much equality during that process, but um, I, I do want to say that if we look at the, the benefit of it, it certainly it offers um, um, more benefits um, than um, a traditional um, in-person hearing, although um, we do have some new um, difficulties that uh, I think we all need to get used to and also find effective ways to, to address them. Thanks, Melody. I, I, I certainly thought that the um, the expert witness area is one in which, um, I, listening to Justice Reyes' description of five sets of experts, hot tubbing, one of them on the phone with bad internet, etc., just seemed like a total nightmare scenario as far as I was concerned. And as counsel, I think it would it would make me very anxious about whether or not our case was was genuinely getting through. And and of course, the expert who's on the phone certainly isn't isn't seeing any reaction. Um, from the tribunal, maybe Judith, and then and then perhaps Melody again. Just uh, interested in your thoughts on on virtual um, examination of of experts and whether they can. It's the one area I think where where most often, uh, if at all, tribunals and courts do try to uh, generate some interaction between the views of of the experts, of multiple experts, if you have them. Uh, and, and ask them to respond to one another's testimony, sometimes through a hot tubbing process or some other form of, of um, alternated questioning. Uh, Judith, your thoughts on whether that's still feasible or whether, whether that sort of interaction can still be achieved? Yeah, I, I mean, just an initial observation. I wonder whether the expert that Anselmo was talking about next time round, if there is a next time round, I wonder if that expert would still have the same difficulties. I mean, this is what I mean by, you know, we all learn from our experience. Uh, and I think people learn that actually, no, you know, it, it's not good enough trying to do a hearing of, from your phone using the inbuilt speaker and video that, that you know, it, it, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not necessarily hugely expensive technology, but, but there are some basic requirements that need to be established in order to have confidence in the process. As far as experts are concerned, um, you know, again, it's just speaking from my own experiences, I've, I've had uh, a number of cases now where we have had experts um, appearing in a virtual hearing. Um, that has gone, I think, pretty smoothly. Um, inevitably, you can get the odd uh, example where things don't, but it's not because of, of, of the process, you know, the sort of background noise and the like. But again, it's it's it comes back to the uh, all getting used to the the, the, the new world. Um, I, I've not actually tried to do hot tubbing of expert witnesses. Um, I, I'd be interested in others' perspective. I mean, my sense is that that uh, the possibility of hot tubbing is still regularly included in procedural orders, um, and it, there was a period of time a few years ago when it was. You know, regularly undertaken. Um, my own experience is that actually parties are less inclined to do so nowadays, perhaps 
with the exception of particular types of cases uh, in the construction field, for example, where you will get experts of the same discipline where it will work. Uh, and I agree with Anselmo's comment that I think the, the, the biggest challenge is ensuring that if the tribunal are going to conduct expert um, hot tubbing, that, that uh, they are sufficiently prepared in order to be able to do it. So um, in principle, I don't see a difficulty with it. The tribunal obviously will need to stay um, in control of the process, but that's exactly the same in an in-person hearing. I suppose the one area that would be different um, and we may lose in the virtual context is where you will have expert witnesses hot tubbing and although perhaps the process starts with them being asked by the tribunal various questions, it somehow morphs into what is more a discussion between the two experts observed by the tribunal. And that I think we probably would lose in a virtual context, um, which, you know, you know is, is less positive, I suppose, in terms of, of that process. Um, but otherwise, I think my own experience is that dealing with experts virtually is, is um, fine and it's not particularly more difficult than dealing with them in uh, an in-person hearing. The one, the one other caveat I would add is that um, experts nowadays, so often they will do a presentation at the beginning of their evidence, and they will be very keen that you have a shared screen to see their presentation, which is fine. Um, but what they also need to realize is that the tribunal need a copy that they can mark up. The, the, the problem with the shared screen is you can see it, but you don't have it there with your notes on um, when you come to write the award. Uh, and so particularly given that everything is, is does tend to be done more electronically now, um, a word for the expert, remember to send either an email copy or to make sure your demonstrative presentation is loaded up onto whatever platform you're using first. But otherwise, I don't really see any particular issues beyond those. Well, a, a direction there that won't need to go into your procedural order number one, Judith, all those watching who are going to appear before you will be ensuring copies are sent through. I was interested in your comment about, about the possible, I suppose, loss of control in, in the hot tubbing context, um, which, as, I, as, you, as you've said, is sometimes beneficial in terms of the direct exchange, but could, could be quite difficult to manage um, virtually, and, I, and I've been in touch with a couple of experts in preparing for today who said that they had hearings coming up where they were specifically suggesting that hot tubbing not be attempted because, because of that specific concern, that it's just so much harder to, to get the dynamic under control in a, uh, unless you're in that room together, typically. Uh, but, but as you say, it may be a question of whether the, uh, the tribunal can find the mute button to, uh, to, <laughs> to just uh, get, switch off an expert who's going on too long or, or unduly interrupting the other. Melody, I think yeah. you had an experience recently of, of acting as an expert or testifying. I don't know if you were hot tubbed in that context, but so did you find it particularly different from what you would normally experience going into a tribunal hearing room or courtroom? Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly, um, I did have um, one recent, very recent experience that I've been doing the last weekend. Um, I was acting as the Chinese law expert in the uh, arbitration in Singapore. Um, there wasn't hot tubbing uh, between the experts. Um, it was just cross examined I mean, separately. Um, but um, um, in my, my overall experience um, in that session was, um, it was quite positive. Um, there wasn't any, I didn't really experience any issue, although um, the experts, uh, the expert for, for the other side, um, he was sort of in a, in a, um, in the eastern part of China, where he said that in his office, the internet connection wasn't really ideal. So he, during the, 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 the session, um, he sort of dropped off, I think, a couple of times. Um, and also he, he, he required an interpreter. Um, so that interpreter was also in another location. And that added certain uh, layers of, of complication and challenges um, technologically as well. So there was some sort of hiccups uh, during his session. Um, and it, it did lasted longer than expected because previously he was given two and a half hours, I think. Um, and then it, it actually run for almost four hours. Um, 
And then while I was a side notice, I was waiting, um, sort of, I was also listening. I mean, I was realizing that this is really the, the, the sort of the screen for fatigue is a real thing uh, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's common in, in, a, in a traditional hearing that um, a lot of times that uh, basically you just sit in the hearing and you listen to people's arguments, et cetera. And then a few hours would go by pretty quickly. Then you don't really feel anything. But, but then I, I was realizing, I mean, you sort of just staring at a screen and then you sort of with your head headphones um, and just uh, you relying on the very sort of a, a, a two the two dimensional um, um, illustration um, that can be um, that can be exhausting uh, in that sense. But but yeah, but I think my uh, my overall experience has been quite quite positive. But I agree with both uh, you and Judith in the sense that the hot topic might be difficult uh, in the virtual hearings. Um, especially if you really want to have a, a, a lively sort of debate um, amongst the experts. And um, I think a lot of times that the tribunal would find it really useful to really get to understand the real issues. Um, that can be um, difficult to achieve uh, in a virtual um, setting. And I, I do feel like um, in this sort of sessions, uh, if you conduct a hearing virtually, um, it almost requires a different sets of cross-examination skills uh, compared with in the, in the traditional sense, because certainly your, I mean, there there would be it would be less spontaneous, as I said. I mean, in the sense that you 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 ha you sort of you you have the questions prepared and you sort of just sticking to the to the script. Um, and um, another natural thing would be obviously other than other than the verbal communications, a lot of the sort of the demeanor, et cetera, and the nonverbal um, means of communications would be certainly lost. And that would be uh, important, I think, for the tribunal to assess the credibility of the witnesses, um, et cetera. Um, and, and another challenge um, I have experienced in these sort of sessions was um, I, I think the intra-party communication um, gets really difficult or it becomes impossible if you're not in the same location. Um, because in, in, if everybody is, say, is sitting in the same room on the same side, uh, you, you can pass a note to somebody. Uh, but this, is, this gets very, very uh, complicated when you're trying to maneuver um, Zoom or WebEx um, during the hearing and try to send somebody a message. Um, it, it can get the quite, quite challenging um, that way too. Absolutely, absolutely. Melody, you touched on something that I'd like to come to next, and I'm particularly concerned that Jim has been patiently uh, observing the two of you conversing and I hope has not been suffering from screen fatigue. But, but many people have been observing that this is a, a byproduct of, um, of engaging in hearings on screen. And some of the institutional guides around the conduct of remote uh, arbitration hearings or virtual hearings have really uh, indicated that, that judges and tribunals ought to take into account uh, that that the that fatigue onset uh, in considering how long each day's hearing ought to be the duration of a, of a day's sitting um, but then also of course we have different time zones involved uh, and that can can also play into the question of, of how long sensibly uh, a tribunal sitting in more than one location could 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 sit uh, and and be giving their attention to the hearing properly uh, and 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 I'm sure that that is something that has been um, you know, it is certainly affecting the efficiency potentially of, uh, of hearing conduct. Jim, I'm conscious that you're sitting sort of three hours ahead of, of most of us in Asia, in Sydney, and, and possibly suffer the greatest prejudice in that context uh, in coordinating with the rest of the world. What sort of impact is that having on, on the conduct of your hearings? Well, I've had one which uh, hearing it was a mediation, but uh, that, that has some special characteristics which we might come to later. But that did involve uh, an agreement of the parties. Uh, council were in London, uh, Singapore, Melbourne, Sydney, and all the money was in London. It was a reinsurance case. So um, the agreement was that we'd sit for four hour days, which ended up being 5 to 9 p.m. in Sydney. Uh, but of course, what happened was when uh, the mediation pointy end came in the last two days, we had to sit on. That ended up at 2 a.m. sittings on the last two days for me. Now, uh, that's well after midnight, uh, to, to use Anselmo's standard of what you can tolerate. Yeah. <laughs> but, he didn't um, sort of brush in, that off as not being a concern. But, <laughs> uh, 
But, you know, in the end, I had a late night and all the uh, people at the council and uh, clients in London had a late lunch. But um, it was an unfair distribution of burden, I thought. But it, it, that, that is a problem. Um, we've all had it in uh, up to his, this stage in uh, uh, hearings on uh, procedural hearings, which also involve the United States, particularly in EGSID. Now, to, to get convenient times for Europe, East Asia, and the East Coast of the United States is pretty hard. And uh, that sort of thing um, will remain a problem. However, it's quite clear uh, we've entered an era where all of this has been accelerated by the pandemic. Probably it was an inevitable, inevitable part progression in this general direction. And now we've entered the era of what I like to call the new abnormal. And, um, and this, we're stuck with it. We've got to find out how to deal with it. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's a binary choice that you go all uh, virtual and all uh, in person. Uh, you can manipulate that. One of the areas may be that the tribunal may need to sit together when it's efficient. For example, quite often I sit with two people from L London or two people from East Asia, um, and it's very easy for me to go to them. Now, any arbitrator who's ever looked at a, uh, a costs um, submissions from parties recognises that the cost of the tribunal travel is a trivial part of most uh, most uh, costs of arbitrations. But whatever, it may be that the sort of thing that Melody just mentioned about the difficulty of interpersonal com uh, uh, communications between one part uh, within a party is manifest also in a tribunal. You just can't, you know, there's a chat function we know, but it just doesn't work the same way. Uh, I have to control my instinct to talk over others. Uh, that probably is a good thing on some occasions, but there are occasions when interruptions actually serve a purpose. And, <laughs> um, but, you know, my practice after the, a day's hearing is to get, get the tribunal together and write down what we thought about the credit of the witness or you know, the other aspects of the testimony. You have those sorts of exchanges during lunch breaks and uh, morning uh, tea breaks, etc. That's just not going to work that way for a tribunal um, during the course of the hearing. And it'll make, I think it'll make the process of coming to an agreement or deliberations harder if you're not. But, but it's something that, yes, uh, clearly there are significant cost advantages of using it, but it doesn't have to be all one way and all the other. There are adjustments you can make depending on the circumstances of the case. Thank you. J Judith, I wonder whether you might also like to comment on uh, the shorter hearing approach uh, that we've just been discussing, that Jim's just been discussing, uh, whether you think uh, as a result of shorter hearing days, uh, hearings in total in terms of the number of days are becoming longer when they're virtual than, than in person, or are council being driven to be more efficient in presenting their case or more astute, as, as Anselmo was hoping, uh, in conducting their cross-examination? I have to say, I've not uh, been in a situation where the parties have said, well, now we're virtual, we need to add on more time, more days for our hearing. Um, I have in most of the cases I've done virtually found that actually we've finished slightly early. So uh, I'm not quite sure whether that says um, council are being more efficient or they just overestimated the time that would be needed for the hearing. But either way, um, it, it seems to be working quite well in terms of fitting in the days. Uh, I mean, I think this time, the time zone issue is, um, it, it's a real issue, but it's, you know, as I think Jim and as, as, as Anselmo said, you know, it needs to be kept in perspective. You know, the odd late night is fine. Where it becomes more difficult is if you are doing a sort of two or three week hearing, um, prospect of doing that in the middle of the night, night after night, I think is one that most would be concerned about, not just 
um, at the, on the arbitrator side, but also on the council side, that they want to put forward their best performance, and that's not necessarily conducive. But um, what I what I have found is that generally speaking, people will start early or finish late, but still within a reasonable range, such that you can have a sort of five or perhaps six hour um, hearing day, and it works reasonably well. Um, but obviously, the greater the time range, the more difficult it is. If it's East Coast of the US, uh, for us here in Singapore, it's okay. We can deal with that. When it's West Coast, it becomes harder. Um, if you have got Europe, someone in Europe in the middle of it, <laughs> there's all these different ramifications. If it's just West Coast and Australia yeah, or Singapore, you can do a morning, an early morning. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's, it's when you need to accommodate Europe in the middle, it mm. then means you know you're you're more constrained so but but these things you know they can all and are being uh, overcome so um i think that's you know that, that, that we can deal with um yeah i think the in terms of how people conduct hearings like one of the interesting things i have noticed and i don't know if others have shared this experience but people are far more diligent about returning at the appointed time from lunch and coffee breaks <laughs> which I, I i i don't know why it may just be that we've all got a little clock there on our computers and so if we're late it's very clear to everybody <laughs> that that's happened but that that is just one interesting observation i've noticed but you know i think uh, you know in terms of um generally speaking these things again are uh, are, are manageable and and, and uh, they are being managed. Jaleda, Thanks, can I just add yes, one? Yes, of course. Yeah. Right. The, whilst time zone difficulties are manageable for the most part, I think in the long term there will be a tendency for council to want um, arbitrators from the, and chair from the same time zone, so that you don't run into any of those problems. So the range of options on how long you sit, the flexibility is there. Um, so it's just a question of whether or not we'll lose that international exchange where I'll be sitting with uh, arbitrators from Asia uh, and not so much from Europe and vice mm -hmm. versa. And that's, I just think there might be a tendency in that direction. So. I, I agree with that. Sorry, I, I think we haven't. What what surprises me in some ways is I don't think I at least have not seen that to date. But if the if the virtual hearings continue as the preferred course, I think you're right. It will be, start to to come into play. It would be interesting as well to see how um, arbitrators, where they are nominated by the parties, then interact over the selection of the chair. Uh, as to whether they look to to avoid, as you say, Judith, the situation where if two of you are in two different time zones, you, you then introduce a third, which would make it unduly complicated. So instead, you, you favour somebody who would align with at least one of you. Um, and of course, as you said, Jim, that, that could be a physical, you could you, even in a physical hearing, that could be beneficial, but it might be more of an imperative if, if you anticipate three of you being in different parts of the clock. And, uh, and where that third appointment devolves to an institution, whether they will take that into account or, or whether arbitrators will be reminding them to take that into account as they, as they consider a, a candidate list as well. Um, we've spent some time now talking about the conduct of hearings and in-person hearings, and I'm conscious that Justice Reyes in his, in his comments talked about that some of the fixations among lawyers in relation to, to the, the, the detail of how in-person hearings take place might be a bit misplaced and, and that the virtual setting is maybe showing that, um, that there are necessary elements for uh, the effective assessment of the merits of a case. So he touched particularly on uh, assessing credibility through eye contact and so on. Um, but I do also wonder whether uh, we need to address the question of, of whether a very full oral hearing is, is truly as important as perhaps um, many of us have imagined. And, and perhaps whether it's really primarily a common lawyer's obsession with the adversarial uh, process. 
Melody, obviously you're working in the, amongst us, you're the one working in a civil law system uh, predominantly uh, in China, although obviously you do, it, you do participate in hearings, uh, which, which perhaps take place under Hong Kong rules, uh, which is more on the common law uh, system. Uh, but I wondered whether you think, uh, you listen to these conversations and think that some of these procedural concerns are really just not relevant, uh, and, and also what impact you're seeing, you mentioned some earlier, uh, but what impact you're seeing um, uh, remote conduct of litigation having on on Chinese court proceedings? Yeah, certainly that's that that's that will be an interesting um, issue to to consider in the sense that um, traditionally in civil law and in particular Chinese law and Chinese proceedings, both in terms of litigation and arbitration, um, I would say probably the oral hearings um, it, it, it tends to to fo focus less on the oral hearings uh, or witness. Uh, testimony um, compared to common law jurisdictions, and in particular, uh, when it comes to like um, 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 witness that oral testimony, um, typically it would be given uh, less weight um, um, if you have uh, the other party produces uh, written evidence. Um, that, um, as a general matter, I think Chinese courts or Chinese arbitrators in a, in the Chinese proceeding, um, they wouldn't attach too much weight to a witness testimony. So that's certainly um, true. And in that sense, you would think that actually virtual hearings should be more uh, widely <coughs> accepted or used in Chinese proceedings. Um, but to my observation and experience have suggested that um, actually, yeah, during the lockdown period, <coughs> we did have uh, a lot of those virtual hearings. But once um, I think China's uh, pandemic control has uh, be sort of in place and domestic travels are sort of returned to the normal sort of level, then um, I feel like the, the judges or the arbitrators would be uh, reluctant um, generally to do virtual hearings. Um, and I think that's perhaps one of the most important reasons would be there's, there's a one very unique feature to Chinese proceedings that uh, it, it focuses very much on the evidence authenticity um, and that's part of the, the civil procedure law of, of the Chinese law that basically um, every uh, evidence cross-examine session, then you have to produce your, the original copy of your written documents um, to the other side and the courts uh, for inspection. And obviously then you can take it back. But then, I mean, before every hearing uh, for Chinese lawyers, the important thing is to contact the client saying like, well, we need to prepare the following evidence as original copy and then we will we'll present it in the court and then we'll return to, to your office. So <clears throat> that feature has made, I think the virtual hearings um, really difficult because then how, how you can effectively produce original copy in front of the screen, then it's not gonna be um, that effective effective. So in that sense, uh, we did have experience uh, previously um, in some of the cases where a virtual hearing was conducted, but then the council, they have among, agreed amongst themselves um, to a location to exchange and inspect these original copies. And at the end of the, the, that inspection, you sort of, you both parties sign on a sort of a, a, state, a joint statement to verify that these, these sort of procedures have been conducted and, and then send it to the court so that there doesn't have to be a physical hearing in the courtroom. Um, um, but those would be the the gut rounds that I think that would be helpful. But um, the general trend I would I would say is in the um, um, in the Chinese uh, proceedings that um, the, the virtual hearings are not as uh, widely adopted in perhaps other other countries, and, and for for that the, the very specific reason I have just said. And so now they um, the the Chinese a lot of the Chinese arbitration institutions have now um, issued new guidelines and then rules basically um, have provided very stringent requirements for, for the tribunal to have a virtual hearing um, if that both parties have, have signed a consent and express it clearly they, they, they agreed to this procedure just because absent of, of uh, statutory rules, then it's unclear as to uh, whether the tribunal themselves would have the sole discretion as to how they wanna conduct um, the hearing under Chinese law. So a lot of um, uh, many, I would say many uh, arbitration institutions have issue to that rules. And in practice, um, I found that the, the couple of cases I've been handling uh, that's ongoing, um, when the parties have a dispute, they, they don't to be able to 
um, they don't seem to be able to reach an agreement on, on anything. <laughs> so uh, typically, if one party agrees to a virtual hearing, then um, we have the three cases where two of them actually we agreed to a virtual hearing, but uh, the opposing counsel didn't. Um, so so it didn't it didn't happen. Um, but but yeah, going back to a question, uh, Jalita, I think generally um, it probably it, it tends to be less, I wouldn't say it's not important, but uh, it tends to be um, less important when you uh, compare it to a uh, common law jurisdiction. And Jim, I know that you've been significantly involved uh, since the time I worked for you uh, in engagements with uh, the judiciary in, in China. And also uh, even as late as last night, we were discussing uh, involved in, in committee meetings with the Supreme People's Court in relation to uh, well, with, in, in the judicial context. Do you agree also that um, uh, civil and common lawyers just have different expectations around the importance of the, the hearing process? Well, there's no doubt about that. And it's not just uh, with China. I mean, I've sat in uh, German arbitrations and things like that. And uh, it's quite clear to me that the two German arbitrators I sat with understood that the German Code of Civil Procedure wasn't binding on the tribunal, but it was the only way to actually conduct a hearing. <laughs> it was, uh, and uh, common lawyers have the same approach, namely the oral tradition of the common law is the only way to do it. And unfortunately, that's, that's my tradition. And I've learned a lot from being an arbitrator about other traditions. Can I simply say this, that the, uh, the origins of the oral tradition and of the, the structure of a hearing where you sit continuously from day to day until the case is over. Um, that lies in the fact that um, in the history of the common law in England, all of these things were decided by juries and you had to get the jury together. And, and there's no way you could get the jury together except on that basis. And the oral hearing was to convince the, fi the only finder of fact was the jury, not the judge. So uh, they required the kind of uh, oral evidence and to see the witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that's gone now, really, in litigation as, as well as arbitration. So we can be more flexible and technology enables us to be more flexible. The constraint, we can now divide the hearing in the sense that if it's not convenient for witnesses to come on a particular day, then you go away and do something else for a couple of days, which most people can do. Um, anything longer than that makes it difficult to get back into the case. I mean, to pick up and put down a case um, many times is just not particularly efficient, but it can work. And uh, there's no reason why we can't do that. So oral hearings, perhaps not for the whole of the case, but for aspects of the case or particular witnesses, it's easy to accommodate now and everything can be more flexible now as we all get used to doing it in this way, at least to some extent. So we talk, we've talked about, uh, again, the, the hearing situation uh, in, and the, the details of, of hearings and whether we really need them. Obviously, ultimately, the most efficient resolution of a dispute is the negotiated one that doesn't require any form of hearing at all. And, and Justice Ray has touched in his remarks on some of the circumstances of the present time in particular that might promote efforts to settle. Uh, things like diminished financial resources, so, so bearing in mind the costs of arbitration or litigation. Uh, companies that are in a borderline moving towards distress might uh, really suffer from the burden of uh, an ongoing pending risk in relation to potential liability. It may, may weigh heavily on the share price, etc. Um, there's obviously the increased uncertainty about how the virtual hearing will come out, so how, how people will fare in litigation, perhaps if they, if they have doubts about procedurally how that will operate. And then uh, just touching on what you mentioned there, Jim, around juries, uh, speaking to US uh, lawyers and, and mediators, uh, again, because jury trials are still, of course, very common uh, in the US and part of, part of the core procedure that uh, actually there's huge delays presently and, and people just have no sense in the present environment in the US when they would get a hearing of their, of their jury trial uh, given, given distancing requirements and so on, it's just impossible to convene. Um, so uh, there may be many motivations for parties to proceed towards settlement more readily than, than they would have in the past. I wonder, Judith, whether you're, whether you're seeing anything uh, around trends in, in that area in terms of the cases that you're dealing with. Are parties settling uh, more frequently earlier in the current environment? Um. 
The short answer, I think, is no, not not from the cases that I've been dealing. Um, I mean, I certainly, uh, when there was an awful lot of lockdown <clears throat> around the world, I mean, I did have one example of a case which settled, um, where one got the sense that it would not have done, but for constraints imposed as a result of the pandemic. You know, one of the lead lawyers in that case was particularly um, uh, involved in presenting the case and uh, he had difficult issues in terms of uh, personal commitments, minding children and the, and the like. Um, and it, that presents difficult issues for the tribunal when the other party is saying, well, fine, but we want our claim heard. Um, and that was a case that then did settle and, and one suspects it, it might not have done, or at least not at that time, uh, had the situation been different. But generally speaking, I have to say, I have not seen more cases settling than would otherwise be the case. I think it's been, um, it, I, I understand all of the factors that are being discussed and you would think that they um, they might well influence things, but certainly, my own, uh, my own experience to date is that that hasn't actually materialised. Thanks. And then, uh, Jim, you mentioned earlier that you had uh, been involved in conducting a mediation. Uh, it sounds like you didn't place undue pressure on the parties to cut off their mediation by reason of, uh, of the end of the planned hearing timing. Uh, but in terms of the virtual setting more broadly or, or otherwise perhaps external factors, did you feel that, that it was in any way a different process uh, because it was conducted virtually and, and with parties, as you say, scattered around the world uh, than it might have been if you'd all gathered in the same location? Well, mediation is a particular example of where you lose a lot in nonverbal communications. I know all the psychologists' research says that we're never any good at assessing the uh, nonverbal communications and we always get it wrong. But unfortunately, that's how we have been interacting with each other for a whole series of millennia and it's where we get our cues from and there's no way of changing that but obviously that will change in virtual hearings and uh, all virtual interactions and uh, that perhaps people of my generation will not be able to cope and the younger generation will have a new set of uh, um, understandings of non-verbal communication. In the mediation session what I missed was uh, seeing the room and in particular seeing the clients. I mean, part of the process of mediation is to indirectly tell the clients that their case might not be as strong as the lawyers who are now representing them have been telling them for the last couple of years it is. That's not easy if you can't see them or communicate with them and that the only people you see are in fact the very lawyers who've been telling them that they can't lose this case. and. Um, that process of under of seeing the clients and how they're reacting I, I, it was a loss, I found. And it, there was a particular person who only turned up at about 1am on the second last night, who I had no idea was there and proved a major impediment to the mediation and uh, representing one of the insurance groups, uh, the reinsurance groups. And, uh, you know, I had no idea who she was or why she, who she represented until the very end. Uh, well, I could only talk to and see her lawyer and no one else. So that did interfere with the process, but you know, may I say it worked. It worked mainly because there was a central traffic controller who told us all when we hadn't turned on off our mics and who ushered us into different rooms and, uh, you know, there's a controlled the traffic complete, completely and very effectively. So, in fact, the process of moving into one uh, uh, meeting and not uh, not a plenary meeting, etc., with one group, not another, all that was much quicker than it would have been in a physical hearing. Worked very well, I thought. Uh, so, yes, it can be done. And everybody came back from their coffee breaks on time. <laughs> yeah. 
I think we did have a coffee break, but <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't much of it. Hopefully at about midnight to keep you going. Um, and one of the good things about uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, hearings is that no one can tell when you're having a coffee because you can turn off your <laughs> video. <laughs> Excellent. I, I have a couple of uh, questions. We're, we're into the Q&A uh, part of the, of the session now, and I, we do have a few more things as a, as a panel that we had planned to discuss, but I, I think it's important to, uh, to bring in a couple of questions from our audience, uh, if people don't mind. Uh, and I'm also going to invite uh, Justice Reyes also to return to us uh, to participate in this part of the um, part of the session, and uh, Jim, because you're the one who confessed earlier that you have to restrain yourself from interruptions uh, from the bench uh, when you are on screen, uh, maybe I'll put the first question to you, and then perhaps uh, Justice Reyes, who also has a reputation for being quite involved from the bench in hearings, uh, would wouldn't mind to comment on it as well. And the question is this. Do the panelists think that more interventionist tribunals become muted uh, if they are hearing remotely, and uh, because they have the inability, because of the inability, as you've mentioned, Jim, to, to interject cohesively or in a timely manner, or perhaps to read the moment when, uh, when, when you could uh, enter in if there's delays and that sort of thing, uh, or, or difficulty that sensing when a person is coming to the end of, of what they're trying to say. Any thoughts on that, or how that's uh, that's worked for you? I did notice that I apparently interrupted and Somo is more involved, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but as Melody said, counsel often like those interruptions because it gives them a guidance as to the tribunal thinking. Now, I know of all experienced occasions, including, uh, not, not from me, but from my co-arbitrators, where the interruptions were not helpful uh, and perhaps too frequent. But it is a process that is, I think, harder on... Uh, online and uh, all I can say is yes you'll lose a bit of both the good ones and the bad ones and some uh, thoughts from you on on that one personally I, I haven't found myself being less interventionist because a hearing is taking place virtually uh, so I don't think it has anything to do whether a hearing is remote or face to face it has to do, I think, with the personality of the arbitrator, the style of the particular arbitrator, or the style of the particular judge. I, I, I don't think there's a, a, a special mute button uh, just because something is going on remotely. Thank you. Uh, the second, uh, second question I thought I would uh, put to the panel is around uh, whether we think this is a temporary or a permanent change. Uh, so. Do, uh, maybe we'll start with um, with Judith on this one. Do you envisage going forward, uh, Judith, and, and obviously Justice Ray has also mentioned uh, some of the, the benefits potentially of, of continuing on in the virtual formats, uh, in, including costs and, and uh, the environmental impact. Uh, do you see this as being a, something of a, of a permanent change? How do you think that we'll go forward with, with virtual hearings? Um, I think my, my view is that um, virtual hearings will be more common than they were before the pandemic. Um, we are all getting used to this format um, and how to deal with matters. And I think there will be now um, a more sensible assessment, if you will, of whether the hearing is one that that it makes more sense for the parties in terms of costs and efficiency to deal with it remotely um, or whether an in-person hearing is needed. I, I certainly don't think we've seen the last of in-person hearings. Uh, and I that view is informed in part by the fact that at least two of my hearings have been semi-virtual. So in one, we had the chair and lead counsel for both parties all in the same room in one location, the other co-arbitrators, the witnesses and the clients all attending virtually. Um, another hearing where the tribunal were all virtual, um, but the parties were in a jurisdiction where they could get in the same room. So, so, so my experience has been that where people can get in the same room, they are still doing so. But equally, I think behaviour has changed in that um, there are some aspects of the process, uh, including tribunal deliberations, including procedural hearings, 
where previously we, there might be a, um, a conference call, which now are being dealt far more frequently by this type of um, you know, virtual uh, hearing, so we can all see each other. And I think that is a, a far more satisfactory way of interacting. Um, so I think the, 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 there's a long answer to your question. I think the answer is, no, this is not here as a permanent fixture and we are not going to get rid of in-person hearings. But I think there will be a far more uh, considered approach to whether or not uh, an in-person hearing makes sense or whether a virtual hearing um, is, is, is a more efficient and cost-effective and appropriate uh, choice to, to adopt. Jim, you seem to suggest that from the tribunal perspective, there are, and, and Judith has mentioned similar advantages, that there is there is much to be gained from at least the tribunal being in the same place uh, for the purposes of, of conducting and, and then also deliberating as the proceeding continues. Do you anticipate uh, continuing to, to want to hold at least the major hearings, as Judith has suggested, uh, in, in person? Uh, and, and perhaps perhaps with some virtual elements, for example, if some witnesses don't attend in person or but but that you would still expect to gather uh, physically once travel is possible? Will depend on the case and where the council are, where the witnesses are coming from. Um, I, I agree that most uh, uh, expert evidence can be done in this way, including ha hearing them together to, to, for a relevant area of expertise and things like that. It's but it's it it will vary. I mean, I think Judith has said much the same that. Uh, It'll be horses for courses from here on, but with a considerably increased virtual element. And Melody, just thinking about advising your clients, so you mentioned that a couple of, on a couple of occasions, your your client has been the party comfortable with the possibility of a virtual um, hearing proceeding for for the conduct of their matter, uh, but but you've faced opposition on the other side, which may be positional, uh, just making things more difficult, but. Um, do you think that the cost elements or some of the other elements you mentioned, for example, greater access for the for the team or for the for the client team, uh, will make a difference in in the way in which clients will view uh, the option of proceeding virtually for a hearing? Um, I, I certainly do think so, um, because especially now with the international travels are not possible, um, a lot of our international clients and they would see a virtual hearing as a great option to be able to participate and still um, sort of carry forward the proceeding. Otherwise, I mean, sort of we, 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 we're going to face a significant delay. Um, so that, that's certainly true. And, and I, I tend to think these virtual hearings with the involvement of technology um, at a certain level, it's inevitable. Um, it's an inevitable development uh, down the road. And perhaps the COVID situation has accelerated um, that process. Um, that's certainly um, an important factor. But inevitably, I think we're going to, I mean, with emails and, and telephones and, and, and then now the video chats, et cetera, and then we're, we're certainly going to have um, more interactions um, done virtually and hearing is, is going to be just part of it. Um, but um, I, I, would, I tend to agree with what just Jim and Judith were saying that um, it, it depends on the cases that I think for more complex cases, um, the virtual hearings, especially the substantive hearings, going to be more difficult to, to set up and, and, and arrange. But um, for procedural hearings, I think um, uh, in most cases, in my experience, that virtual hearings should be sufficient um, in order to, so to be able to achieve like a, a, a agreed list of schedules and et, et cetera. So, so, so I, I think that's gonna be, a, uh, from my, my perspective, that's gonna be a, a welcome change um, that to increase efficiency, that it's the, at least for procedural hearings for both I mean, arbitration and litigations, then uh, perhaps uh, things can be done uh, more virtually than, than before, because we all have the experience that at least for um, um, uh, Chinese litigators, I'm not sure about you, Jalita, because Singapore, I mean, I, you don't really have, it doesn't really take much to travel within Singapore, but, uh, uh, but for Chinese litigators, I think it's not uncommon for people to have the, the experience of you have to, um, for me, like I have to fly three and a half hours to Shenzhen for a hearing, like a, just a procedural meeting for less than an hour. 
Um, so that certainly has happened a lot before. But um, but now with this this involvement, um, I would think I tend to think that um, uh, it's it, it makes sense um, to develop more of this sort of protocol to have virtual hearings um, for at least procedural matters in the future. Thanks. Yes, we can see where the, the obvious efficiencies might arise there. I have to confess, yeah, the five the five minute walk to the to the court from here is probably not uh, <laughs> something I can complain about even for a short hearing. So I, we're coming close to the end of, of the time we have, and it's, it's been an excellent discussion. I, I did tell the panel I would give them uh, one last opportunity uh, because we have one final thought. Uh, I would I'd be keen to hear from each each of you, including Justice Reyes. Um, Plainly, as, as Jim mentioned as well, the, the pandemic and, and, and COVID-19 has forced us to adapt the resolution of disputes to, to the online setting. I, I'll ask each of the panelists to mention very briefly, what, what is one thing you think is better now uh, and, and that we would take forward uh, to the future? And, and Justice Reyes, given that you've been extremely patient and, and saved your interventions, <laughs> whilst you've heard everybody discussing your, uh, your initial thoughts, uh, perhaps I'll give the floor to you first. I, I suggest that um, one aspect of COVID-19 that we should be taking into the future is the ability to look critically at what is important and what is not. In other words, uh, we've seen how virtual hearings may bring advantages. I wonder if we can go beyond that and consider other possibly heretical uh, procedural steps such as asynchronous hearings where the, the court or the arbitral tribunal listens to one party, possibly without the other party being physically or uh, present uh, remotely, but the whole um, hearing with unilateral hearing, shall we call it, uh, is um, recorded and that becomes part of the record. Uh, so to deal with things like time zone and other difficulties, I wonder if we might start looking at more, exploring uh, more uh, possibly theoretical uh, ideas. Well, Judith, I rarely suggest that I need to come to you for orthodoxy, but, but uh, perhaps you could suggest what you think uh, is the element of the current uh, proceedings that would, you would like to take forward or think would be an, a continuing improvement. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, it is, um, and again, this is a very personal comment, it's, it's the fact that the pandemic has accelerated hugely my being dragged into uh, the electronic age. And, you know, we've all had to deal with the fact that offices are shut, deliveries cannot be made. Um, and the volume of paper that I knew, use now is a tiny fraction of what I would previously have used. Um, and I sort of I have now become so much more comfortable dealing with electronic versions of documents and submissions and you know, making sure they can be properly marked up. And, and you, I'm just so much more familiar with that process. And I think that is a very positive thing. I mean, it's all clearly it's a bit like the, uh, you know, improving our, 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 our footprint. It, it, it's all heading in a positive direction. But, but on a personal level, I think it's not just uh, saving the planet, it is also made for greater convenience, although I got there because I was forced to get there in some respects, or at least got there more quickly, should I say. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, I think speaking for, speaking for the, uh, the volume of paper that as a law firm we're printing now, uh, that has just reduced dramatically, uh, and mm -hmm. it must be the case across the whole arbitral community that, that arbitrators and counsel indeed uh, are going much more paperless or at least paper, paper lower than they used to. Um, uh, Melody, maybe a quick thought from you and then from Jim. Yeah, so, so, so certainly I think, um, as I said, the efficiency is, is, a, is a good, certainly a good part of it. Um, and we need to sort of people need to just embrace it. Um, I'm part of the old fashioned group that are still, I mean, like the sort of the, the hard copies of documents and, and the in-person meetings, I think that you can get a lot of more, a lot more uh, out of it. Um, but uh, just one side note is um, uh, in terms of um, the um, negotiations and settlement discussions, 
um, our, our clients, I mean, we did uh, manage to achieve one settlement through those virtual meetings. Um, and um, after that, and then everybody agreed to have a virtual cocktail hour uh, <laughs> online. So that was that was a very interesting um, experience. <laughs> and, and thankfully, the cocktail is now virtual. So so that was that was good. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but it just just shows that people actually with um, with, with the sort of the involvement is is techn of technology and also the 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 situation, um, I think people can adapt pretty quickly. It's a different version of the usual signing ceremony at the end of the, right, uh, yeah. the end of the negotiation. Jim, the last word from you. Well, the old cliche goes: necessity is the mother of invention, and it, it was true in this case. We've all invented new ways of doing things and become more accustomed to things that. Uh, um, we're beyond our age range, or at least my age range. Below, <laughs> well, but you know, and it, it works much better now. Everything works much better. The question is, uh, where do we strike a balance between the, the conflicting requirements of uh, due process? Thank you. Definitely a thought to take forward in terms of uh, further reflection. That, so I, we've come to the end of our of our discussion, and I want to thank very much our speakers today for for their insights. It has been a truly fascinating, I think, exchange of perspectives. Uh, even though uh, we, most of us are we're all based basically in the Asian region, it's uh, I still think it's been very diverse. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to imagine the virtual ovation that I'm I'm fairly sure you're you're receiving uh, from uh, your online audience. Uh, and just before I hand back to Bob to close our session and to uh, reiterate our thanks to our speakers. I would also like to register my thanks uh, to Rick Grove and Judge Elizabeth Song uh, from the Organising Committee of the Conference who collaborated with me on the composition of the panel and the content of the session. So thank you both very much as well. So Bob, back to you, I think. Yeah, just, just a few last things. First of all, thanks, Julita, for pulling this panel together and to Judith and Melody and, and Jim for joining your panel. I, I found it a very interesting discussion and, and uh, Justice Reyes, you, you set the tone with your opening remarks. Uh, which I found very insightful. I, I mean, the reality is we're not going back completely to the way things were before, and hopefully we, we pick the best of both worlds as we move forward. So that's, uh, I, th I think that's something we can all focus on going ahead. Um, so uh, again, thanks to thank the panelists. I'd also like to thank the, uh, the attendees for, for joining us, um, both those who are with us live and those who will hopefully watch us in the future on our recording. Uh, this event, as I mentioned before, is the final session of our Asia Conference. Prime Time, which is our virtual events program, is now moving into our third series of events, and that will be in the first quarter of 2021. So keep your eye on the Prime website, on your emails, uh, on other communications uh, for more details about those events. We'll be sending around an evaluation form. We've, we included a link in the chat for everybody, uh, to all attendees for your feedback. Um, this is an online form that takes less than a minute to complete. So we hope uh, you all take a little bit of time to, to give us your feedback on this session and to the extent you've joined us for other sessions on those sessions as well. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Clifford Chance, our global law firm sponsor, DTCC, LCH, and Rudder Associates for sponsoring the Prime Finance Asia Conference and Burford Capital for sponsoring this particular session. If you're interested in sponsoring a future event, please do get in touch with Prime Finance. Uh, finally, thanks to Lexus and Nexus for their support of this and for promoting this program. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we face financial challenges as many organizations do. Uh, we have a, uh, a mechanism called Friends of Prime uh, where we accept donations uh, to support our work. If you'd like to make a donation, you can find out more on the website or you can contact Camilla McPherson uh, for more information about how to support Prime Finance. Again, thank you, everyone, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again, or you seeing us, whatever it may be, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>